Okay. Uh, Jordan Mugu. Uh, he'll present an antenna with a bunch of adjectives in front of it. That, uh, I won't even try to go through the time. Then that optimal profile of material will be 
uh, measured or simulated if, if computational resources allow. So this slide is an important one. It shows the entire story. We have a feed displays off-axis at a particular location in the XY plane. It emits a ray of electromagnetic radiation. So carried by that ray is a small piece of the wavefront. That piece of the wavefront is described by what's called a curvature matrix. That curvature matrix describes how that energy is expanding, or that wavefront is expanding, contracting along the ray, and therefore how the energy is either increasing or decreasing along the ray. That ray then refracts into the lens. The ray becomes a space curve because of the, the nature of the inhomogeneity within the <coughs> lens. The wavefront curvatures are now, the radii curvatures are now a function of the arc length, a function of the position within the lens. You refract out the lens, impinge upon the aperture plane, where equivalent electric and magnetic currents are obtained. Image theory is employed to double the electric currents and rid of the magnetic currents, and we obtain these non-uniform samples of aperture field, magnitude and phase in the, in the aperture. In order to prepare that data for FFT, we have to rectally linearize the data with the Linnaeus triangulation, and then we can apply the fast Fourier transform algorithm to get the far field pattern for that particular lens. So the question we have to ask here is, what is the optimal top lens surface profile? What is the optimal bottom lens surface profile? And what is the optimal material inhomogeneity in order to produce the best thing we can scan at a particular angle? By body of revolution symmetry <coughs> imposed in the design as a constraint, we then allow this design to be done at only a single point. Because, because of the symmetry, if I put the feet at any other location within the focal ring, I can get the same beam to scan in a conical speed. So, to, in order to calculate the electromagnetic field with any inhomogeneous media, a lot of mathematics has to be solved. These are a lot more difficult and the complexity increases when compared to, say, straight ray geometrical optics and homogeneous media because a bunch of differential equations result that must be solved numerically on the computer. So what we do is we take the asymptotic expansion for the electric field, plug it into the wave equation, and, and two equations result. One, the iconal equation, the other, the transport equation. The iconal equation will lead to the path of the ray. So we recast this in a form suitable for calculation on the computer by the Runge cutter to the fourth order algorithm, and that, that equation is known as the light rate equation. The Runge, Runge cutter to the fourth order algorithm gives a series of points of tangent, ve tangent vectors along the ray, which we can then interpolate to get the path of the ray within the lens. The transport equation is solved twice, once for the, the direction, the unit vector E, and once for the amplitude, the uh, magnitude of E, and we, we calculate then a divergence factor and a polarization equation, which are then solved and amalgamated into a transport equation for the electric field within the lens. So how are we going to link PSO and PSO and geometrical optics? Well, in order to describe this lens, we expand the top surface profile and the bottom lens surface profile independently and separately into their own fourth order polynomials that with unknown coefficients. So each set of coefficients will describe a new topology for that lens. We also expand the material inhomogeneity in the two dimensional uh, surface fit for a two dimensional expansion in which the unknown coefficients then describe some sort of expansion for the material parameters for the epsilon within the lens. The total number of coefficients here are 14. There are four here for the top, four here for the bottom, and, and six more for the, the material parameters within the lens. So that total of 14 coefficients, each set of coefficients of the 14 coefficients describing unique lens which needs to be evaluated by geometrical optics. So the, the, the optimizer passes the 14 element vector describing the particular design to be evaluated to geometrical optics. Geometrical optics evaluates that design and compresses this 14 element vector into a single scalar value representing the fitness or how well that design performs according to a predefined fitness function. Here we're looking for the standard deviation of the phase to be low or the phase to be uniform in the aperture. We also include a term to reduce the number of total internally reflective rays. So we want the maximum number of rays to reach the aperture. And we also want to reduce the volume, which is also a, a goal of this project. So how do we obtain these four, how do we obtain the optimum coefficient? Well, we have 14, <coughs> 14 dimensional hyperspace. <coughs> we take each of our unknowns and we put it on one of the axes of this hyperspace. So that each point within the hyperspace then defines a particular geometry that could be designed by its projection onto all 14 axes. And that defines those coefficients. Then we have a, each B within the solution space, 14 dimensional space, it stops in its position as time is iterated, each iteration of time, and evaluates its particular design, compresses that into a scalar fitness value, and associates that position within hyperspace with that scalar value. And PSO intelligently uh, determines or directs which direction each of these Bs are to go by having a sort of competition between the personal best that that B is seeing within its space, so it wants to look towards its personal best, it also wants to go towards the global best, the global best in the entire swarm, which is in this direction, 
and it has some inertial velocity of which direction it was going. You add these three vectors, you get your new direction. So that is how the bees traverse the hyperdimensional space. They eventually converge upon the optimum of these are. So we use this algorithm to design first a 30 centimeter centrifuge in homogeneous lens. This is the ray picture plot that resulted from the optimization in the geometrical optics code that we wrote at UCLA. This is the particular permittivity profile that, that resulted. It has the densest uh, permittivity in the center and least uh, towards the edges. And here's the convergence plot for the particle swarm optimization, showing that indeed the, the optimum design was obtained. This is the 3D printed version of that lens. So I'll get into next how the inhomogeneity is implemented through the 3D printing process. How do we do that? So the optimizer gives us an optimized inhomogeneous solid lens, which is continuous. The, the ray within it is, and the permittivity distribution is continuous. So how do we discretize that or voxelize that lens so that we're able to 3D print it and, and with a single print polymer, a single permittivity print polymer material in order to obtain an inhomogeneous design? Well, we go ahead and discretize this lens or voxelize it into a grid. And that grid is, is as shown with these struts or the support strussing that hold the cubes together. Uh, at each location, we're able to change the dimension of a cube in order to either fill that cell with less or more material in order to increase or decrease the effect of permittivity at that location. So here we have an empty cell, which is just showing the grid work. And that gives us the permittivity of 1.2. A full cell, which is completely filled, gives us the permittivity of the print polymer, which in this case is 2.686. That it, it basically the way this curve is obtained is the interpolation between the permittivity of the print polymer and the permittivity of free space. You just interpolate it directly through a, what's called the fill fraction. How much material is in that cube versus the total volume of that cube. So for example, if I had a three millimeter cube at a particular location, then I would obtain a permittivity of 1.6. Each of the cells that we discretize this in are of course lambda not by five. So we, did, we went ahead and fabricated one of these lenses and measured in the UCLA plane bipolar near field measurement range, and these are the results we obtained. Here's the lens depicted in the UCLA plane bipolar near field range. We have a patch and feed that we developed to the optimally, optimally illuminate the lens, a 10 dB edge taper, and we obtained near field, we, we obtained near field measurements to the FFT to get the far field, and these are the results. So the red result is the measured result from plane bipolar near field. The black, is the, the black curve is our geometrical optics code that we wrote that can handle inhomogeneous materials. And the blue curve is full wave simulation with CST. So the importance of the blue curve shows that the full wave simulation agrees well with the geometrical optics simulation. And for the geometrical optics simulation, which is very much, very much quicker than the full wave simulation, we only look at the straight rays to the aperture. We don't consider multiple internally reflected rays that will bounce around in the lens. But full wave simulation does. And what we've seen is good agreement between geo and, and, and CST. Which validates our approach. And of course, the measurements also validates our approach. So, we also measured the cross pole. The cross pole is low, it's less than 28 dB around, and, and uh, that's acceptable for our case. We also did back projection. So, we took the far field that we measured or we, that we calculated from the near field measurements and back projected them to the same plane of the calculation for the geometrical optics code and compared the near field phase. And what we obtained is uniform phase in both cases, showing that the lens is doing what it's supposed to do, it's collimating. The, the beam and, and, and making the phase uniform in the aperture. So then we decided to look at materials. What kind of materials can we use to print this lens with? And what would be the resulting gain of the antenna and the efficiency? So what I did here is took this lens, implemented three different, uh, four different materials here. One with no loss, one with a lower loss tangent called Altem, one with a, a higher loss tangent called PLA, and then a Visigate Amber material which has an even higher loss tangent, and simulated that in CC Micro Studio and got the results and patterns. And what I was able to do in CST is to calculate the radiated power, the dissipated power, and therefore formulate a radiation efficiency, multiply that onto the directivity to get the gain. The reason why this last step is, is justified is because the patterns are similar in all cases except for visage of amber, and that therefore we assume that these two terms in the efficiency are, 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 are similar. So then the gain is just a directly multiplication <coughs> of, of uh, the gain is the multiplication of the radiation efficiency. So in this case, we decided to converge upon Altum for multiple reasons. The first is Altum is a space qualified material, and second, because it has the best radiation efficiency, the least of not this power, a dissipated loss with 88% efficiency rate. So we went ahead and used this algorithm then to design our spinning swapping weather radar satellite with the antenna, which means that we need to obtain off-axis design. So we displace the feed to this location, ask the optimizer to give us the right permittivity, the optimum permittivity, the optimum shape to give us a beam at a particular scan angle, and after some amount of iterations, the optimizer converged upon the design shown here. 
this is the optimum epsilon for a lens and the optimum shape for a lens, which is to produce a scanned beam when fed off axis at this location here. So the good thing to note is these two are similar in volume and axial thickness, which is, is, a, is a benefit for our project. And the other thing is, this was a little bit of a difficult design to obtain. And the reason is, well, I had to add this term to the fitness function in order to try to maximize the ray density in the average. <coughs> because in the case of the center fed lens, the rays naturally want to spread out. But when you go off axis, the, the rays kind of want to bunch up a little bit. So you have to try to add a term to the fitness function to give you the right permittivity to, and shape to try to maximize your, your density of rays in the average. So does this lens actually produce this conically scanned spinning, uh, spinning spot beam? Well, I went ahead and simulated this, uh, this lens, the optimal lens, at four different feed locations in the XY plane along the focal ring. So we had the, le the feed position here, 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 and here. At each location is a number one. It's associated with the beam, which is marked number one, the UV space plot, which is marked number one, and the data in the table, which is marked number one. So uh, in this case, you can see that as we've displaced the feed or moved the feed to four different locations in the XY plane along the focal ring, the beam indeed does revolve in a conically scanned spinning spot beam type characteristic of these uh, weather radar satellites uh, for wind scatterometry. And it, in the directivity shows that all the beams are very similar, and of course the, the, the pointing is such that the beam would rotate within the, the conical scan uh, pattern. So how are we going to populate the, that focal ring with feed elements so that we can then excite them in succession and get this beam to do the, the conical scan? Well, what we've done is we've decided, or we've designed this preliminary focal ring array. So this right here is the feed that we designed to illuminate the center fed lens and the measurements with. What we did is we piled this feed along a focal ring array at, with an offset angle in order to produce this focal ring array. So you hit each of these coaxial ports in succession one at a time that produces one beam in the sweep and then you're able to, to get them to discreetly analog that to the continuous scan of the, the, the parabolic reflector on the mechanical motor. <clears throat> so this is, this is the design we obtained for a 60 centimeter lens. We, I wanted to point out that we also fabricated a 3D printed 60 centimeter lens, but this one had to be printed in octants and fused together in separate pieces because the print bed itself cannot print the entire lens in one go. So you have to print it in small pieces and we had to find a way to fuse them together and we were able to do that, and this is the result. So this lens is about the same, is about the correct radius to show you the, the, the uh, ratio of how this would look underneath that, according to this figure. So what I've done here is I've created a new spinning spotty wind scatterometer weather radar satellite. The old satellite has a mechanical motor with moving parts which are prone to failure over time, as shown in NASA's history, and the the idea here is to replace that with a spinning spot beam, same, same beam scan, but no moving parts, all electronic. And, and that is, this is a sort of a cartoon depiction of what could be placed upon the space station to replace the particular scatterometer that's up there now, that of course is failed. So in conclusion, we identified a problem with the current weather radar satellites and tents. They're moving parts, they, they have wear and tear over time, friction causes them to seize, and then the satellite is no longer usable. We then developed a design approach to synthesize an all-electronic version with no moving parts. We developed a custom curved rate GOPSO uh, synthesis algorithm software in order to obtain the, the uh, optimal design. We validated the design approach and 3D printing techniques through measurements in the UCLA plane bipolar near field measurement range. And we used that validated design approach to obtain all-electronic spinning spot beam weather radar satellites and feed design. And a hope is all electronic spinning spot beam type spaceborne wind scatterometer antennas will prolong the lifetime of weather radar satellites in the future. I did want to point out one thing that in 2018, technology highlights uh, we got the first space feature. So every year, JPL, all the projects they worked on, they condense into this little periodical that they distribute to, to, the, to the public and also to the, the employees at JPL. And we got, our, we got the first page feature in that one, which is it said printing better radar. And I, I've also brought this particular design here is for, for if you guys want to take a look at it after. So thank you for your attention, and I wanted to uh, invite any questions here, and I also want to point out that thanks to the team here at JPL and I that uh, worked on this and some of the designs that we had come upon uh, that we used along the way to get to the, the large final design. So thank you very much. We have time for a question. presentation. So could you explain the difference between your lens and the traditional Bloomberg lens or Gottman lens solution 
that doesn't have off-axis versus on-axis problems that you mentioned. And the second related question is that, what are the weight limitation issues? How do you compare the weight of your lens antenna compared to the rotating mechanical antenna for space application? Mm -hmm. So the answer to your first question is, for the Lunenburg lens, what we have is a large sphere, which of course you can, you don't have this off-axis, on-axis problem. You can put the feet anywhere and you get the beam out from the other side with no scan loss, which is ideal, but that was too large. So that was, the, that was the problem there. We had to scale it down and reduce the weight so it became practical. And that we were able to do that to quite efficiently. So um, that, that's the answer to your first question. That, that's how it compares. The second question is, our lens weighs approximately 19 kilo, a, a very large 60 centimeter design. And when you add that to the feed array, it's very comparable to what would be the parabolic reflector and the mechanical motor spinning assembly. So we, we've achieved a replacement for that in, in even the weight sense which is uh, what's one of the major goals of the project. Yes, the, uh, you showed one plot of cross-polarization, uh -huh. uh, and I think that was taken on axis. Mm -hmm. How about when you scan the beam off? How much, how, do you have uh, much more degradation of cross-polarization? Uh, yeah, so the cross-pole that we have for off axis is only through simulation. We haven't seen it, it's not significantly worse. But we didn't do measurements on the off-axis design yet, so I don't have that number for you. But uh, it's not it's not significantly worse. Thank you so much. Uh, you don't have <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we'll give a break right now. All the chairs and their representatives.